everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour, a meeting place that encourages photographers from all over the country to connect, inspire, and create. My guests share tips, techniques, and the stories behind their photographs, and they inspire us to improve our photography skills. The schedule for upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com. And if you haven't subscribed to the Happiness Hour YouTube channel, please check it out for sessions that you may have missed. Tonight's guest is Patrick Crone. Patrick is a South Carolina-based nature and landscape photographer, a former photojournalist and photo editor. Patrick took a step back from photography a while back to focus on his career, but in 2016, he purchased his first DSLR and has not stopped creating photographs. Patrick's images have been exhibited in local galleries near his home in Aiken, South Carolina. He teaches photo classes in his community, and for two years in a row, he was selected as the artist in residence for the South Carolina State Parks. If you're on Instagram, you can find him at One Eyed Dog Studios, and you can connect with him through his website at One Eyed Dog Studios.com. That is one dash. Or is that hyphen? I think it's one hyphen eyed dog studios.com. One eyed dog studios.com. That is a mouthful. But in tonight's presentation, the commute, a daily practice of photography. Patrick will address the challenges of carving out time for photography and share a few things that he's done over the past few years that have helped him find the time to fuel his photographic expression and what changed his way of thinking from. There is nothing to photograph locally to making photography almost a daily practice on his commute. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Patrick. Hello. So, gosh, you've taken care of my first like 10 minutes of my slides. <laughs> Thanks. You know, um, I really like digging into people's yeah. websites clearly. That's why I'm like, hey, put in your website. Um, so I'm sure I missed something. So if I did, because I do skim, sometimes I'm like, well, what I find interesting, you may go, well, she completely missed what is really important to you. So if I miss something, jump in and share it. So um, before you start that, I'm going to do a little bit of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A little disclaimer, full disclosure. Um, I have attended um, out of Chicago, which is a on, well, they do in person um, conferences, I will say all around the world, but a lot of places in the world. And a, a couple of years ago when the pandemic started, um, they said, hey, let's do this online. And they brought in a huge number of, of instructors and a lot of people signed up. It was crazy fun. And they've managed to continue this. And um, this year, last year, they did something called the attendee takeover. And I believe they selected, and if I got the number wrong, tell me, I think they selected seven of you and gave you seven minutes to do a presentation. It was basically go. And um, I I love watching those. And, and I will say, I, I've sat through a lot, a lot, a lot of the programs, um, the classes that are taught there. And one of the most exciting things for me. And it also makes my stomach knot is the attendee takeover. Cause I'm like rooting for you guys. And it, it just blows me away. Um, that there's so much talent, not just in the instructors, but the attendees. And you were one of those people. And I'm like, your presentation just kind of grabbed me and went, oh, makes so much sense. And, um, I was, I didn't know you but I reached out and said, Hey, and, um, now I, I, I know you, so I'm super excited to finally get you, um, on the schedule to do this presentation for us. So that's just my, how did we meet and how did you get here? You were trapped and I'm okay with that. So yeah, me too. Um, with, <laughs> with that, tell me what I missed, uh, 
feel free to jump in and share a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, I'll be going through a lot of that stuff, but um, okay. yeah, it was fun doing that takeover. And um, I wasn't sure who you were at first, but then you said you wanted a speaker. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. It's like, I try <laughs> to say yes to things. And then it was blown away that you were like, it won't be until July. And this was February. I'm like, okay, this is really serious. Because I was thinking it would have been, you know, like, oh, I need you in two weeks, <laughs> you know, type of thing. So I was like, oh, wow, she's got a lot of great people. So very, well. Very, thank you. Very few people say no to me because they're very smart that way. It's just easier just to give in. And yeah. so it, 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 it's been fun to be able to fill up the calendar. And um, when people as generous as you give up their time to, to share what they're doing um, with a bunch of strangers, it's even better. So all right. Well, hello. <laughs> First off, let me thank uh, all of you for uh, coming in and listening tonight. Uh, I know some of my coworkers, and I know, like I said, I saw some of the Aiken artists and maybe other Aiken people. So if you're here, also put that in the chat, but I think I saw most people doing that. Uh, and then also thanks to all the loyal and new Happiness Hour attendees for coming into the room to hear me chat about my photo work and look at some of my images. Um, like Linda said, I'm Patrick Crone from Aiken, South Carolina. Uh, it's partway between Columbia, South Carolina and Augusta, Georgia, where they have that little golf tournament every year. I used to actually live behind the National at one point. So uh, Linda heard me give that seven minute talk at out of Chicago this last February. Uh, and it was about my daily commute and trying to keep up my photography, even though I'm not currently a uh, full time photographer. I'm going to try to make this somewhat interactive uh, since everyone's videos are off, so I'm not going to let you all nap if at all possible. Uh, there are a couple of things that might be helpful as we get started. Um, I don't know what everybody's current situation is, so if you would like, uh, please put in the chat if you are a working photographer or in a job that is not directly photography related or even just retired. Uh, I guess basically I want to know if you're a working photographer or not. And then I'd also like to know... Uh, you know, where you're at. Are you really into photography, just a passing interest in photography, or are you like Linda and you like to stalk photographers as she does? Uh, though she is a wonderful photographer, she is also a very, very good stalker, as we just talked about. Nobody says no to Linda and her schedule is filled out. So keeps keep coming back every week. Um, if you're still putting things in the chat, um, here's my little agenda. Um, of what we're going to talk about today, or I'm going to talk about today. Um, First, some of my background and how I got to where I am today that Linda did not fill in. Uh, I'll give you uh, a tour of my second home. It's called the Carolina Bay Nature Preserve. It's not a typical bay. I do live inland in South Carolina. Uh, some images from my front yard since I work from home during the pandemic and still do two days a week as a hybrid. And a few images from my uh, right uh right around my office. That doesn't sound like a place most people would photograph. And when you show you the picture, you'll probably understand why. Uh, and finally, a few other places I sometimes stop by and on my way uh, to and from work. Uh, throughout my talk, I'll give some of the strategies and ideas I have tried to help make my photography a daily practice, even though I'm not a full-time photographer. And I hope some of these ideas uh, I put together will help inspire you to maybe, maybe find ways to photograph more often. Also, as a subtext of this talk, <coughs> uh, to e also inspire each of you to look and photograph more locally. Except for the few images I'll show uh, next about my background, all the rest of the photos are taken to, coming to or from work in Aiken. Oh, I should have said here, I'll explain this one. This is... Um, uh, railroad tracks I cross over every day going to the office uh, and caught uh, the sunrise coming off. And it, yes, it was that magenta. It was very, pay, uh, very pinkish. I forgot to go back on this one on the opening. This photograph uh, that I call Dawn Patrol, um, I was not in the middle of the road. I was actually at the divider of the road uh, with a long lens as they're coming at me. And yes, the sky was that color and I kind of very post-apocalyptic. So I forgot to mention that. It was kind of fun. So, whoops, oh, wrong button. I gotta remember which computer I am doing which thing on. Sure, do um, you want, Patrick, do you want me to give you a kind of a roundup of the responses you've gotten? Uh, yeah, why don't you, if there's some, uh, if there's some yeah, that are valid. Yep. Yeah, there's quite a bunch of them. Um, there's a lot of people who are not professional. There's, there are a couple of people in here that they are doing uh, real estate photography. You know, like Christina says, real estate photography pays her. Yeah. But 
photography pays her soul. Yeah, um, there you go. Yeah. So Mark is a full-time engineer, but he's a serious amateur photographer. Mm -hmm. um, Carolyn says photography is her passion. Um, Mina's like, I'm not a working photo person yet, or sadly, but maybe that's just a yet, Mina. Um, Gail is retired. I know that she's been taking pictures for a very long time. Um, Anne's not a professional. There's a bunch of amateur hobbyists uh, in the room. Um, I love Kevin's response. He's striving to be the next Vivian Meyer. <laughs> 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 um, Gary is a retired engineer. There's a lot of engineers in this room. Cool. Um, yeah, but he's a fairly capable shooter. That's a big lie. He's more than capable. I've seen his work. Um, <laughs> okay, well, it sounds like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, there's a bunch of people, but for the most part, there's a lot of part-time photographers in here that do sell some of their work. Um, there, there's a good mix in here, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of what I was uh, expecting. And then also hoping that I was talking to the, the the crowd in the right way. People that are either retired or um, have a regular job, but maybe try and think ways to get their uh, photography a little bit more part of their daily life. So great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess kind of a little bit of who I am in my background. Um, I've enjoyed photography since I was a little kid. I even remember I had one of those little, little 110 cameras. I don't know who else might have. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't until I was 16 and living in New Zealand uh, that I got my first 35 millimeter and really fell in love with the medium. I went to the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California for two years where I studied art. And I was supposed to do chemistry, but that didn't work out. My photo teacher and I realized I was, uh, my work was more journalistic, so I transferred to the University of Missouri in Columbia, where I earned my bachelor's of journalism with a concentration in photojournalism. Uh, there, um, whoops, sorry. Um, uh, their photos are, uh, Oh, I say these photos are in a basic order of when I took them. Like this one was at the uh, Sports Illustrated Sports Photography Workshop in Minneapolis, Minnesota, when I was doing my internship after I graduated. I worked for two newspapers in the West. Uh, in both places, I did all the typical daily newspaper assignments, spot news, general news, sports, features, photo stories. Uh, these first few are from the Daily Herald in um, Provo, Utah. This is at a protest at the state capitol. I called too much noise. It was very loud in there. And for you rodeo people, uh, this was the high school rodeo uh, finals in Heber City, Utah, as they were getting ready prepping for uh, the Broncos uh, to do the Bronco rides. Uh, and so I got actually in the, the, the area with them because, again, being high school, you have a lot of access. A uh, place in uh, Lehigh, Utah called Porter's Place. I went black and white to give it more of a classic look. And then this is a guy shredding in uh, on a gravel with his snowboard in the middle of the summer in, where was this, uh, Provo Canyon in Provo, Utah. So I was there for five years, and then I went from there to Butte, Montana, uh, to work for the Montana Standard. Oh, sorry, I forgot about this. That was sports in uh, uh, in Utah for Utah versus BYU, and I call this one just a little bit of pass interference. You know, you got a little bit of there. So again, sorry, I went to uh, Montana after that, where I got to shoot some spot news of people flipping their cars after maybe drinking a little bit too much. Sports photography, again, a lot of high school sports everywhere I went. I got to love a, um, a kid having a flames on his on his cast and still won the race. I also did photo stories. This one was on a large animal vet in uh, Montana. We traveled around with him for a few weeks. And then after I left there about two and a half years, and then I moved to Augusta, Georgia in 1998 to be the photo editor at the Augusta Chronicle. Like I said, I did that for about two years. Uh, when I did get to photograph, since mostly I was running, helping run the department, I uh, worked the night shift. So I mostly got to shoot sports, things like um, the Augusta Lynx, which was a, a semi-professional uh, hockey team, and then a boxing match, which I just like this picture. So I hope you see in this selection how I would try to get beyond the obvious image and look closer at the quality of light, the composition and design, the shapes and textures in the frame, and then of course try to capture a moment. 
I think this is still part of me and how I approach my work uh, as a nature and landscape photographer here in South Carolina. But in, 20, in 2000, I left photography to get into sales. I earned my MBA from the Augusta University, uh, and I joke with a lot of my artist friends that I'm one of the few people with an MBA and not an MFA, but, you know, they still like me anyway. Whoops. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is my this second career lasted about 12 uh, years. I sold advertising for the same newspaper I worked at uh, as a photo editor. And then I moved to selling copiers. And then finally, I sold fiberglass. I left sales to start my third career as a pricing analyst for Hubble Utility Solutions. I moved over here in 2012. In 2016, I decided to get a DSLR and get back into photography a bit. But it wasn't until 2019 that I decided to get more serious about doing it. My boss, who was a very serious wildlife photographer, uh, suggested I start an Instagram page. Um, and I thought Instagram was more for real photographers, but it did give me, uh, I did give it a look and signed up and started to post a few things. I think this was one of the very first images I actually posted. And um, uh, again, going back and forth against the railroad tracks. I still was at a loss at the time to see how to become a real photographer again. Then I heard the talk by a photographer and uh, entrepreneur called Char uh, J Chase Jarvis, and he was talking about creativity. Everyone always uses the phrase, fake it till you make it, and I was one of them. He said, no, faking it gets you nowhere. You need to make it till you make it. And again, this is uh, another morning crossing the railroad tracks. And yes, it did look like the X-Men were coming out. And that was the way the light was. Uh, it was that same intersection as this, but there was uh, a rain the night before. So it was a nice big puddle showing up. So with that in mind, I made it take your camera to work day every day. The next step was kind of where to go. I learned very fast that there is no grand vistas in Aiken, just a lot of trees. And I live about five miles from the office, and my commute is usually only about 10 minutes. So not a lot of different scenery to work with, or so I thought. During the summer and fall of 2019, I didn't take too many photos on my commute, unless there was something interesting, like uh, weather, uh, interesting weather like fog, like when I go out and go photograph some horses or some trees at one of the local parks. Then one day uh, during my lunch break in mid-November, I decided to stop by this little nature preserve called Carolina Bay. Carolina Bays are all over the Southeast. Uh, they're interesting geological features. We're not even sure where they come from, but they're kind of fun. Uh, there I found these amazing trees called bald cypress, but I didn't know what their names were at the time. And if you know anything about bald cypress, you know that they are one of the few conifer trees that their leaves change in the fall, drop off, and grow back in the spring. And that in the south, November is prime time for them. So I happened to stumble into the place at just the right moment. I should say I've been to the bay before, but that was about seven years earlier when my daughter Mina uh, and two of her friends did their Girl Scout Silver Award, uh, their project there. They built birdhouses, bat houses, and some of these benches that were put all around the park for people to enjoy. That's why I took this photo. That bench is hers. Every day that week of the falls of 19, I got up a little earlier and stopped by for about an hour before work like this photo that I took at the dawn, and you can see the cypress in the middle there. This, this photo will come up a little later, you'll see. Uh, then I would rush out of the office at the end of the day to photograph some more. That week was one of my most productive, and some of the images are still some of my favorite, and even the most popular, like this one. I call that the Cypress. Um, I'd like to stop here for a moment and talk about the equipment I was using at the time. I want to use this image because it will help me make my point. Even recently, this one is still gets juried into shows, even though it's from 2019. Uh, and it was just juried into the show at uh, the water exhibit, currently at the A. Smith Gallery there in Johnson City, Texas, if you know it, run by Amanda Smith and Kevin Tully. It was juried by Elizabeth Avedon. I brought this up to say that this photo was taken with the simple Canon T6i and the little 18 to 55 millimeter starter lens that everyone gets. Not that this is the greatest photo ever, but it is 
it is one of the ones that people seem to gra constantly gravitate still. I'm just pointing out that very nice photos can come out of very basic entry level gear if you put up put the work into it. Many of the photos still to come in my in my presentation were with this setup. I now use a Canon R, but I used this T6i for more than two very good years. Anyway, back to the bay and this tree. Since falling in love with this bald cypress, I committed to documenting it uh, for as long as I can. And you'll see that this, three, this tree throughout my talk. But here are some of the other seasons as well, the winter, the spring, and then the summer. And these were all four were taken with the T6i. I still need to get the summer one a little bit better, but uh, maybe I'll work on that this year. And it wasn't just the trees that drew me there, but the water and the bay and and was, was the other feature that uh, is pretty prominent, as well as a lot of spider webs. This was taken one morning and it was really kind of breezy, so I had to play with trying to get things just right to keep the, the spider web from moving. So that was a little tough. I started making it a habit to go to the bay as much as I could before work, after work, and even during lunch. Though I didn't buy, stop by all the time, I knew early on that these small visits would be investments and would pay off over time. It's been more than three and a half years and I've made thousands of photos here of all sorts of conditions, like this one with the water coming up. And that green, is, this was at dusk, and that green is what's called uh, duckweed that comes up a few times. Okay, well, let's get back to the theme of my presentation uh, and talk a little bit about how to plan your photo commute. And maybe you all that do go to work each day can take some of these ideas and get in a little bit more photo time. But you might be thinking, hey, Patrick, you have it easy. <laughs> yes, I live close to work and the bay is right on my way. So let me talk about some of the things I have done and how even with a different type of commute, you can make things happen. First is timing. No matter if you have an hour drive or just a short walk to your home office, you have a routine that has gotten you from place to place just fine, just like I did. But now you are going to shake things up and buy yourself some extra time. For me, it was talking to my wife. Her response, okay, as long as you get your chores done, you can go out and play. So for the rest of you, it might be different stakeholders in your life. It could be your children or even your parents. I call this one the uh, album cover of the emo frogs. It just looks like they're you know posing for an album cover. <laughs> even talk to your boss. If you have a long commute, Maybe they will agree to let you work from home one or two days, though that's kind of redundant now that most of us are doing that. And of course, another spider web in another uh, dewy morning. You might even want to shift your schedule. Go in late to work. Uh, sorry, go in late, work late, so you have the mornings to shoot. Go in early, get out early, so you have the evenings to shoot. You won't know until you ask and talk about it. You may be surprised, and I hope in a positive way, by the understanding and willingness of all those around, all those people around you to help you. I started getting up earlier. Uh, I was amazed that even a few minutes earlier helped move things along. If you have a long commute, have you noticed if you, if you leave a little earlier or later, how different the traffic is? Same in a household. Those few minutes meant that I could get the kitchen all to myself and get those dishes done without others getting in my way. I don't have any major, I don't have many evening commitments, so I don't have any direct advice there. But again, talk to the people around you. Again, here's some Cypress as the water level was down, I was able to get a slightly different angle on some of the, uh, uh, the trees as they turned in a different fall than the other ones. <laughs> if you have children doing events, maybe you can do carpools with other parents to free up one or two evenings. I really looked at how. I was spending my time. There were a few things that I found that were really sucking it up. For you all, maybe you can think of a few things in your schedule that can be combined into one or just, or get into one day or just get rid of altogether. Overall, this helped me set priorities in my life, my life and make clearer those things that are important to me, mainly photography and family life. And I figured out ways to make it work and it helped me clean up my schedule a little like how this stream got in the bay got cleaned up from one day to the next. Those pictures were actually two days apart. So just things change a little bit every day that I'm there. 
pick a place to explore, not necessarily photograph, but explore. I have no idea what I will find in a place when I first go. And many days, I don't know what I will find. I would suggest the same for you. I'll talk a little bit more about finding a place and how to explore in just a bit. So this is a photo looking across the bay uh, in a winter morning or winter afternoon, actually looking at the, the bald, bald cypress. So I, like I said, I like to shoot black and white every once in a while. Next, I got my gear ready to go. Keep it simple. You don't know what you might need, so don't worry about it. Though an umbrella is often very useful. This was taken in February of one year, uh, but that's not ice. That's actually rain at a four second exposure hiding underneath my big golf umbrella. So I don't golf anymore, but I always carry a big golf umbrella. But I do carry my camera every day. That's the key. And like they say in the horror movies, get out of the house. Don't waste your time and uh, don't waste this newfound time. You made that commitment. Your family is helping you make that commitment. Don't squander it. I unfortunately sometimes do. Speaking of the house, time to shift our attention to my yard and a little bit of my neighborhood too. As I said, I was getting serious about photography in mid-2019 and started really getting going to the Bay in that fall of that year. At about that same time, I saw an ad uh, for a photo contest with a gallery in Augusta, Georgia. I was like, ah, what the heck, I'll try it. I entered three of my images. Uh, two of them were from the Carolina Bay, and of course, the bald cypress picture was one of them. All three got in, and at the opening, I met the owner, Regina. She liked my work and asked if I'd be interested in doing a show with her. And I was in yes mode, so I said yes, just like I did with Linda. <laughs> and and I I picked that cup coming. I'm sorry, I and I picked that upcoming April 2020. But as we all know, COVID hit. I still hung the show, put on some masks, and no one showed up. So that was a drag. This is a little gardenia on a small little um, plant around the corner from me. It's kind of scraggly little plant by the tennis courts. This was taken one Friday night. Um, the next day it had rained. So I went back to the little, the little shrub and took some more. And the picture from that day actually got into the show. This one did. <laughs> Anything with rain always helps. So, and on the work front, like many other people who could, my company had me work from home during that whole time. To keep up with my photography, I decided to photograph a few of the things in my yard and neighborhood. As you can see, I don't have the best looking yard, but what, you, but what I wanna show is that you don't have to have a beautiful garden to take nice photos. In fact, sometimes I don't even photograph my yard from the inside, but from the inside, from the outside, but I photograph it from the inside out. Like this image of our lantana from the front window on a very humid July morning. When I opened the curtains, I saw this, all the condensation on the window. I grabbed my tripod, made a few frames, and then logged onto my computer for work. At about this same time, I saw a few photographers on Instagram doing what they called dark macro. Most of them looked to be doing their work in a studio, and they dropped out the background from around whatever their subject was. Well, I don't have a studio, and I really don't want to take the time or had the interest in doing that much in Photoshop. So I brought a trifold poster board in black, just like what the kids use when they put on their science fair projects. And they would put behind things. This is so much better for me. I'm much better at figuring out how something looks in scene and how to get the best angle and light. I don't want to mess with the image too much afterwards. This is what I call um, the life cycle of a hosta. This is a hosta in my front yard and it goes everything from the little baby all the way through bloom and beyond. So anyway, I started finding little things around my yard that caught my attention. I would set up my board and my tripod and have fun. I often kind of wonder what my <laughs> neighbors would think about me. Uh, the one on the left I call the courtier. It's a uh, spider wart uh, plant, and it looks like it's taking a bow in front of a king or a queen or something. Then, of course, some dandelions. To stay with the theme of uh, commute here, I'm only displaying images I did take first thing in the morning, at lunch, or after work, just like I would when I was commuting. Since I really wanted to understand light better, 
sorry. Since I really wanted to understand light better at the time of the at any time of the day, I challenged myself to photograph more in the middle of the day. We have all been told the middle of the day is such bad light. Just wait for the morning or evening. Nope, not for me. Uh, these photos, I made a little still life and a cool little red bottle I found of some daisies. And then the one on the right is uh, quail grass, which was keeps coming back and growing up in some of our pots. So I keep photographing it every year. I want to be able to work in any light in almost any conditions. So during the summer and fall of 2020, many days I would deliberately not go out and shoot until the hours of 10 a.m. or 3 and 3 p.m. Not at all, not all the photos I'm showing here are from that time of day, but I will point out the ones that were, like this one on the left, which I call the big reveal, was taken about two o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, I should back up here that these two were taken in the middle of the day. And that's it for that so far. Just a second. I was remembering many times as a photojournalist where I did not have the option of waiting for the right conditions or waiting for the right light. I went out when the assignment was going on and I worked with the light and other conditions as best as I could. Remember the snowboarder on the gravel? Kind of like that. I got good at working with what I had. Again, this uh, and the one on the right, if I didn't tell you yet, is a uh, garlic, little garlic plant. Uh, you'll see that again uh, as well. And I've got it growing again. I'm trying to find another photo for that. <laughs> I recently heard Sarah Marino talk about her photography. She also would shoot any time of the day. She talked about how some photographers would look outside and think the light or time of day is no good and not even attempt to take out their camera. What she went on to say really struck a chord with me. Quote, every day is a good day to take out, take the camera out of the bag. There's always something to photograph throughout the day in any light at any time. End quote. Her talk was great and she made, she became one of my favorite people. Uh, the one, the image on the left is uh, what I call cascade. I like photographing old dying plants. It kind of gives a nice, uh, interesting colors and things. And then the one on the right is called Balance. I photographed this one as I was walking my dog, my one-eyed dog, uh, walking back into the house. I noticed the dew hanging out on the leaves of this uh, purple heart flower. Took her inside, grabbed my equipment, carefully put up my board uh, because I didn't want to knock any of the dew off. Took a few frames, packed everything back up, and then ran off to the office. I hope I wasn't too late that day. <laughs> Um, Balance also was awarded an honorable mention in uh, last year's Nature Conservancy's International Photo Contest in the plants and fungi category. So I was pretty, pretty pleased with that one. Here are a few more images uh, from around the area. This first image is of a little zinnia I saw growing in my gutter around the corner from my house. I ran out after work to get this before my neighbor mowed it down. As I scroll through the images from my yard and my neighborhood, I'd like uh, I'd like you to set aside. Oh, I'd, I'd like to give you a little aside about my pandemic experience. I have to say, I think during COVID was. Sorry, I'm trying to get this back. I'm sorry. Um, I have to say, I think my time during COVID was a little different than most people's. First off, I was able to work from home and work I did. My company, Hubble Utility Solutions, did not slow down during the, that time, and in fact, really has not slowed down since. Uh, this photo is a leaf on the hood of one of my neighbor's cars. Also, living in a pretty rural type area gave me a lot of freedom to move around. I was able to walk around and photograph at local parks like the Carolina Bay and in my neighborhood. Often I would be the only person out and about, so I didn't feel like I was putting myself or others at risk. I saw this uh, little set family, what I call a little family of mushrooms, hiding in my front uh, garden, and so I took a picture of them. So I thought it was fun. Bottom line, I stayed very busy. I got outside into nature a lot and was able to photograph a lot. I know many people and most photographers felt very confident, confined and limited in what they could do or felt their creativity was very stifled. So I know I was very lucky in my situation. 
last side note on all this, uh, my wife and I finally did get COVID, but it wasn't until this May after coming back from a cruise on our vacation on our honeymoon. So, uh, and here's some more garlic. This was taken again, talking about the middle of the day. This was taken around noon one day, and that's the lights coming through the trees behind it. All right, this last image I will show from this set was taken this April. As I was getting into my car to go to work, before I get into the story, any guesses as to what that blue haze behind the flower is? Anyway, um, I saw the light raindrops on the rose petals and quickly set up my tripod. I played around a bit with the depth of field to see what, the wor what would work best. I even tried to focus stack this, but it didn't have the right feel when I put it all together. To me, what helps this image is that light blue background, which is my neighbor's car from about 30 yards away. <laughs> Here are three quick images from my dogwood from this spring. One Friday morning, working from home, I logged in, did some work, then grabbed my gear to see if I could get some shots of the tree in bloom. I even had my step stool out to get me a little higher angle uh, to get into the branches and do some better different things. I've really been enjoying photographing things with these circles this whole spring. So that was kind of fun. So, all right. So changing gears here a little bit. Let's look at how, look at maybe how to find a place when you really don't think there is much around you or so you think. Let me ask another question that you can share the answer in the chat if you want. And so we'll look at these when they come up maybe. If there's a place or even a few places you would love to photograph, it doesn't need to be local just a place you really want to photograph. For me, it's like the Pacific Northwest. So put one or two of your favorites in the chat if you want. Uh, and if you want to share them, that's fine. But right now, I'll just keep going. But Linda, if you want to jump in at some point, if not, no big deal. Now, I want you to consider how these places differ from where you live and where you do your commute, if you do commute. And even think about the places you see on a regular basis. And maybe even ask yourself why the places near you might not be getting your photographic attention. As I said in my intro, I live and photographed out west for about eight years. When I first got into Instagram, I decided to follow all a number of Western photographers to see what they were up to. So all I was seeing in my feed was wide open land, sorry, wide open landscapes, places, great mountain vistas, things like that. When I drive around Aiken, that's not what I would see at all. All I saw was a bunch of trees getting in the way of the view. That was my attitude to begin with. As we look at this slide, I'd like you to maybe think about your attitude towards where you live. This is a list of some of the things I told myself why there was nothing to photograph near me. And what I've heard others say about their hometowns, like I'd photograph here, but there isn't any, and then just fill in the blank of what's not there as opposed to what is there. And the photos I'm showing here don't have any of these things. All three were taken on my lunch break while I drove home the, in one spring day, and it was a little bit of a rainy day. If you live anywhere near pine trees, you may know what these really are. These are uh, what these are photos of. Uh, the first two are pine pollen on the walk in my, on my front walk with the design the rain had made. The last of this is my car's driver's side window. For me, the real reason, the real shift in attitude came from carrying my gear every day. The more I photographed, the more I saw there, what there was to photograph. If you have your camera, you will start seeing more. My advice would be pick a place not too far off your typical route near your house partway to the office or near the office. This way you're not taking up time getting there. When I first worked for Hubble, I had about an hour commute. I wasn't a photographer at the time, but I think about it now. There were often some parks I would eat my lunch at. If I had my camera, then I might have made a few, taken a few minutes at lunch to see where things were. What I'm saying is get creative and get thinking about what's really near you. And likely you already maybe have a place or two in mind. Go explore them. And this leads me to my next exciting location. This is the manufacturing plant where I work. Stunning, isn't it? <laughs> Just another cinder block building at the outside of town. 
In this plant where I'm a pricing analyst, my company makes a few things for the electrical utilities, uh, arresters that go on utility poles or in substations, insulators that help hold up the power lines and cable accessories that go inside those green boxes you see in the yards, uh, in the yard and the side of the road. And this might be all you see as you drive by, power lines and all, it's just this little building, okay? Again, I have my camera with me. I can react to the things I see and make some nice images. None of this would be considered high art, but these can be fun and help me see things as they happen. Like on a clear spring day when I saw the moon was rising and I was able to frame, get it framed inside some of the products. Uh, on the left is one of our switches. And on the right are three what are called brace line posts. Those are uh, the insulators that are actually made in my plant. So I framed those up there. Or when I see cool clouds and sun rays while I'm walking back to my car at the end of the day. And again, I can work in some of our products like the insulators again. Here's another cloudy day. Uh, the one on the left, the parts hanging from the insulators are some of our arresters uh, that are protecting from lightning, like the storm that is coming from the bottom of the frame you can see there. This was actually taken around the corner from my office on a different day than the other three that I'm showing. So, On another day, the parking lot I usually use was full. I went to the one on the other side of the plant. There I saw this Carolina Jasmine climbing up the bobbed wire. On the way out of work that evening, I walked over and to take a few photos. But I was trying to move around without drawing too much attention to myself because I didn't want people to get nervous while I was out there with the camera. Uh, this last one though is not part of my dark macro series, but I did shoot it with the trees in the background to make it go really dark. I called this set Beauty and the Bobbed Wire. I'm glad I took these when I did. A couple of days later, I was back in that same parking lot and the blooms were all gone. So sometimes I fun th find fun things and odd things in the parking lots itself. This curly mud that I got down on my hands and knees to get. Playing with a little intentional camera movement or ICM. These were some weeds growing up in one of the parking spots. To me, they looked like a little flock of geese taking off. And of course, the obligatory pollen puddles growing in the spring that I took this year. I think this is actually my favorite of all the my pollen pictures this year. And then lastly, there was this tree that I've that had fallen over in a storm last year. I'd been playing around with the stump and the shadow uh, for a few times until they put up a new tree this spring. Sometimes my coworkers would see me and ask what I was photographing. When I would show them, some of them would think it was pretty cool, and some would shake their heads and continue walking to their cars. But remember, none of these would have come about if I didn't have a camera. Now, my last set was talking about how you may find a place. Now, if we pick a place, let's look at how to explore it. I keep saying explore, not photograph. It seems to me I'm more relaxed uh, and have more fun when I don't go in with any real expectations on what I will find. Here are a few tips on what I think about going into a place. Kind of like a blind date. You have no idea what you're getting into. Be open-minded. You might be a little like kissing a frog at first. Like this guy who was hanging out one lunchtime when I was slowly creeping up, but he didn't move. Most other frogs run away, but he just sat there. Was able to get his picture, actually. Do short visits. Maybe 10, 15 minutes is something, and it adds up over time. After reworking your schedule, like I talked about before, you might find even more time or even go back on the weekends. It doesn't mean you have to work, do this just on your commute. Little mushroom I found on one of the logs, and that is not water running. It's actually just the reflection of the sun, uh, sun rising across the, the bay. Don't expect much. Just let things happen. I'm not a wildlife photographer, but I do try sometimes. I don't have expectations on what I will see or how the images will come out. And I had fun watching this guy do his fishing. So it was kind of neat. I never get to see that close. So in fact, some days I don't even take many photos and just walk around. This is kind of the back area of the Carolina Bay. 
commit to going for some time. And sometimes things aren't always prettiest, but keep going. Uh, I would say go at least, you know, two weeks, uh, a month, 10 visits, give it some time. Don't go, don't just give up right away. Give it some time. Uh, talking about how things aren't always the prettiest. This was taken one night in the winter after leaving the office. And those are lights from the strip mall behind the Carolina Bay. Go at different times of the day and night. Even go back to the same spot and see how things have changed over each visit. Like this first photo taken on a fall day and the next one a month later on a foggy morning. You can see the difference on that log, how the water level changes. Notice the light and what, what the place is revealing to you. There is most of the uh, cypress are in the water, so I can't actually get very close to them. But there is one that's on the side of the, the shoreline that I can actually get up into that I was able to get some uh, close-up photos. And there's another one later on that I'll show as well. If you have given it some time and it's not working out for you, fine, move on. It's not you, it's me. This photo is uh, some a dragonfly that was, had died in the, I think that's duckweed is what it's called. So. Now this last group is from, oh, sorry. Uh, this last group is from a few of the other places I like to visit and are on my commute as well. Though I will say up front that my better photos from these, in, from these locations were usually taken on weekends and holidays. The first spot is South Boundaries. Oh, sorry. This road is the most iconic place in Aiken and likely one of the most photographed roads in the state. Rainbow Road in Charleston is likely the most photographed road in the state. Uh, there are the overarching live oaks that really say that you're living in the South, but it is also a very busy road all the time, especially during the commute. Because of its popularity, I avoided South Boundary as a photographer for a long time. But the lore and the beauty of it is obvious, and I'm lucky enough to drive on part of it every day of my commute. This image was taken on a foggy August morning in 2020. It was our first day back in the office after working from home for more than a few months uh, during the COVID. Uh, the stay in the office, I don't think was very long. Uh, I think within the month we were back home for a while. So I was lucky to actually get out for a bit. South Boundary is a residential street that people actually live on. Uh, some of my favorite photos are from this road, but most of them were taken, but not done when there are a lot of commuters for sure. So again, holidays and weekends and when I go to get it when it's quiet. So often on my way to or from work, I see something in the light that catches my attention and I pull into a side street and get out, get out my gear and look like the lights coming through the, the branches of the trees or the sunlight in an evening uh, on the changing colors of the ivy. There's another beautiful residential street just one block over from South Boundary called Colleton Avenue. The highlight here are the handful of ginkgo trees and no, I did not place those leaves there. This one is actually pretty close to the how it looks in the raw file. <clears throat> It was a very cloudy morning and these branches were in shadow. I normally don't go for high key images as you saw my dark macro work, but it works here. And I like the simple, almost Japanese feel to this one. Usually in the spring and the fall, I will take a small detour to ride down Colleton and see what might catch my eye. I stop when something like this rose and fence in the morning light or when I see a lush growth of wisteria in the afternoon and I get really lucky that there are some bees around. I'm going to close out this tour of Aiken by stopping at our little train yard. We've seen the train tracks a few times during this talk, but here are the actual engines. There are just two engines that move a few freight cars around, but they sure do stand out. I cross over these tracks every day and have seen a few, and you've seen a few of these images already. And one morning I noticed a huge moon set right over them. But by the time I pulled over and got into position, it was too low and nothing to shoot. But it got me noticing when there was a full moon so I could try and stop by early enough to see if I could get something anyway. 
these face east, <clears throat> excuse me, these face, face east, so they're usually beautifully lit in the morning. Though foggy mornings and sunny afternoons will also get me to stop and look around these other points along the track. Again, this foggy morning was the same foggy morning. I think that south boundary image. So here you got the kudzu uh, getting grown over the signposts. And then on the right, uh, nice afternoon light with the uh, grasses growing gives a nice southern feel, I thought. Later in the summer, like around now, uh, the morning glories really come out and add a lot more color. Being in nature has taught me Oh, wait, sorry. So pulling all this together, I'd like to give you some of the important things I have gotten out of my photographic commute, and I hope maybe you will as well. Being in nature has taught me to appreciate what is there when it is there. Like when in June 2021, I took this photo. But when I went back in July, just a month later, I found another tree had fallen on one of my favorite cypresses. I almost gave up the bay. Good thing I didn't, but you see what how, how many pictures I've taken of this tree. Since I go at different times of the day, I see how the place looks in different light. Like this one, again, that one tree that I can get close to. Uh, this is during a rainstorm in the morning. Oops, sorry, wrong button. I now look closer at things and try to go beyond the obvious. And this is a very helpful when I'm out in other locations or as I'm walking along the path, something catches my eye. I'll drop down and take pictures of it just because, hey, why not? I understand my camera much better. These photos were taken within a, ten, a span of 10 seconds with a couple of stops difference in each as a cloud covered the sun and I had to react to it. I have learned how to make changes quickly I don't want to be looking at the perfect scene only to fumble with my settings. Muscle memory only comes with practice. <clears throat> now I try a lot of new things here because the stakes are very low, like ICM, intentional camera movement. I haven't gotten the image I want yet of this tree, but I do like the cubist nature of this one, or stained glass window almost. As I said, I've been connecting with the art community and have people reach out to me often to paint or even quilt some of my photos. If you remember this photo from early on, this is a quilt that a friend of mine named Betsy Hughes has made. Uh, and I told her that her quilt has the look and feel I wish my photo did. Also, she and I in September are having a joint show in the part of the Aiken Center for the Arts. So trying to make those connections. I've gotten a reputation as a reliable local photographer. And because of that, some people have even come to me for projects because they think the way I photograph matches what they are looking for. Uh, this one was taken uh, last April, not this one, but the one before we had had a tornado warning in the area at the office. Afterwards, it was still raining. I stopped by just to see what was happening at the bay. I go out in the rain a lot. <laughs> My company is remodeling my front office, and there are they are considering using some of my images around the Aiken, from, from around Aiken on their new walls. And I think that's pretty cool. And of course, here are some geese hanging out in the Carolina Bay. Ultimately, and most importantly, doing photography. Oh, sorry, let me back up for a second. I'll explain this picture first. This was a winter morning, another foggy. Love to go in the Carolina Bay when it's foggy. Uh, as you can see, that tree is falling apart a little bit more, but I'm hoping this year uh, it may have bounced back enough that uh, it will start looking like it did when I first met it in 2019. So, sorry. All right. Ultimately, and most importantly, doing photography consistently and almost daily has given me a lot of confidence. I don't carry top of the line gear, but I do know how to use it and the way that I want to use it. I'm comfortable enough with it to, new, to try new things and see what happens. Because of my commute, my photographic windows are very small and very challenging, but I like it that way because my practice has really built up my confidence. I believe I could be put into any situation with any type of light and come away with a nice photo. It might not rock the world, but it won't be a snapshot either. 
I could make something that was well composed, well thought out, and visually interesting, I would hope. I also know that if you are able to add more consistent photography into your life, your confidence level will also go up. There will be some hits and likely a lot of misses. Not everything will be an award winner and most aren't even close, but daily practice helps me be more in tune with what's around me and, to paraphrase photographer John Barkley, better to receive what images come my way no matter the day or time. And maybe, just maybe, you might look forward to your commute. So thank you very much. Um, and this is Rogue, the one-eyed dog out at Carolina Bay one time. Uh, she passed away this last winter, so that's kind of a drag. So here is my contact information, which I know that um, Linda also shared. So that is my little show and tell. That was a great little show and tell. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. Let me I guess I'll just show this real quick, not that it's a, it's really a big deal, but uh, I know some people ask about equipment. So this mm -hmm. is what I, I used for much of this, which is, like I said, my T6i and the Canon R. Those are uh, most of what I have. So, sorry, go on. Any questions or thoughts or comments at this point? Should I stop sharing? Whatever. Yeah, let me go ahead and get you to stop sharing just so that I can properly thank you or put you on the hot seat. Let me see. Um, let's start with a nice comment from Karen. She says, your photos are lovely and your presentation was inspiring. And um, I'm going to agree with that because I, okay, I cheated. I, I knew what the first seven minutes or what seven minutes of it was going to be. And so I had seen some of these photos, but um, I, I am... I always come up with a word. I always say tickled and I don't know if that's the right word, but I'm tickled because I do, um, I got so much more um, out of your presentation this time around because there was so much more um, meat to it as far as like there were more photos, there was more backstory and, um, you know, make me feel like a little bit of a stalker, but I have a feel of what your commute looks like you know, kind of a visual of what does Aiken look like? You know, you said you're about five miles from work. So that's like a 10 minute drive. That could be a lot of things, but um, I don't, I'm, I don't think I've ever been to South Carolina. I might've nipped the, the state line as I was driving <laughs> through it very quickly, but I've never been to South Carolina and um, the Carolina Bay, is that the name of the the area right. that's gorgeous that really reminds me a, a little bit of east texas you get the big right. cypresses right mm -hmm. and i would have never assumed that south carolina would have this kind of um uh landscape or foliage uh these type of trees so that's kind of like ooh, i look at that we're not so special in east texas <laughs> Yours is much bigger. Mine's only like about 30 acres is about all that is. It's really small. You can actually walk around the bay. It's like a, a third of a mile, not even a half a mile circumference. But, you know, I, through photography, I don't know that until you just, you know, now you gave away the secrets. But um, it, <laughs> it, it's beautiful and it's impactful. And photos can take you to places that we didn't know existed. And maybe, you know, maybe a lot of people don't have mountains or, or rivers or oceans near them. But I think what you said resonated with me. I grew up in a tiny little uh, town in South Texas. There was nothing there. There is still nothing there. <laughs> But I've been making, I don't want to say making my own practice, but when I do go to visit my mom on weekends um, while she sleeps, I hit a specific back road and I go up and down that road and, and sometimes you find a lot of nothing, but each time the light's just a little different wildflowers in bloom that wasn't in bloom and won't be in bloom in two days. So it's just kind of fun to see that, um, you're doing that on a daily um, um, practice. <laughs> you're doing that daily, whereas I kind of do it, you know, once a month when I'm visiting my mom. But it um, still has the same result the same, by putting the, the time result. in. Right. And, and the value of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got photos that nobody has. You've got photos that nobody has because no one's really thinking about, you know, heading down to the train station or looking for those little bitty um, 
uh, vignettes of fences and roses. And um, I want some ginkgo trees. Why don't we have those here? In town? <laughs> that is beautiful. So Patrick, thank you for sharing. I'm looking really quick to see if there are any questions in here. I'm not seeing any questions and that's not a bad thing. Um, I, in fact, I kind of, you know, I don't mind it when we don't have questions because I think that that is um, your presentations are all encompassing. So that's Really, really cool. Um, I'm going to read you a couple of nice comments. Um, Christina is saying it's inspiring and motivating to see what I could capture if I was taking more time along her regular commute. She's always, and she, you're like everybody else, Christina, I'm always just focused on getting to the next appointment, but I could be finding little gems in between. And so maybe, maybe you have influenced somebody to slow it down and look for those um, moments that we can just take kind of steal away for ourselves. And um, it is really nice and that your wife is in here and your daughter's in here that, you know, they I wanted at least somebody here. <laughs> I know, right? giving you permission to yeah. off once your chores are finished. So yeah. I'm good boy. through the <laughs> All right. So Patrick, thank you. You've been coming for, for many months now and, and it's so nice to have you as a regular and it's um, a sincere thrill for me to have you come and do a presentation for the group. Um, Cause thanks for inviting me. That was kind of cool. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> I know people get scared when they get emails from me, but then they're, that it's, that it's not so bad. It's I'm not that scary. No. So, all right. If you're on Instagram, you can find Patrick at one eyed dog studios and you can connect with him through his website. One hyphen eyed dogstudios.com so one-eyed dogstudios.com with a little hyphen between one-eyed it's that supposed is, to be grammatically correct that <laughs> is a, it is but it's very difficult to say i know <laughs> i need to buy one-eyed dog too i'll do that when i get one do that <laughs> So next week, Vancouver-based cinematographer and video editor, Chelsea Xavier Blower, will be here to present From Photos to Motion, Essential Tips for Videography. Um, and I'm just going to throw this in there for anybody that's in the room. Um, Chelsea has been working for National Geographic Photographers, so I'm hoping she'll be able to share some really behind the scenes stuff of, of stuff that she's been working on. And I know because I've seen her work and I think you have too. We may not realize it, but we've seen her work um, in some of the productions that uh, Nat Geo has 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 put on 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 the main channels. So, but until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we will see you again soon. Mm -hmm.